All successful revolutions depend on popular support. In the general election of December 1918, we, the Irish people, said yes to the pursuit of the Republic. But did any of us know what that really meant? Did we say yes to physical force revolutionaries? Did we say yes, we are prepared to go to war in pursuit of national independence? What we did say was yes to Sinn Féin's Republican policy. Its election manifesto committed Sinn Féin to using any and every means available to render impotent the power of England to hold Ireland in subjection, whether through military force or otherwise. Sinn Féin also promised that its new Ireland would be run in a fairer, more competent and more Irish way. In return for the support it received, Sinn Féin made certain promises. The democratic programme of the First Doyle, pronounced in this room on the 21st of January 1919, promised the Irish people that things would get a lot better, that their welfare would be a number one priority. Not only would this not happen, for many Irish men, women and children, life would get worse. The Limits of Liberty is the story of Irish independence, how governments of the early decades of independence were preoccupied with one overriding issue, power. Power held by small elites in what would become one of the most centralised countries in Europe. On that Tuesday in January 1919, the leader of the Labour Party, Thomas Johnson, shed tears as he listened to the democratic programme being read out. He and the Sinn Féin TD, Sean T. O'Kelly, were the authors of the document. But in truth, the whole event, the Declaration of Independence, read out on the day by Cahill Brewer, the message to the free nations of the world, the democratic programme, they were all just political theatre, high rhetoric. More cynical men, men like Kevin O'Higgins, were later dismissive of those words. Largely poetry was how he described the democratic programme. It shall be the first duty of the government of the Republic to make provision for the physical, mental and spiritual well-being of the children. To, to secure, secure that, that no child shall suffer, suffer hunger, hunger or cold from lack of food, food, clothing or shelter. Now, it's unambiguous. You can't, you can't say that maybe they meant something else. It's very clear what was promised there. And it was our contention, and you know, you could you could argue that it's it's the contention of the of the left today that this has never ever been the first duty or indeed the, the 21st duty of the government of the Republic. Dreams of liberty collide here with the realities of power politics. In the end, much would be promised, but little delivered. That was how the story would go. And Kevin O'Higgins knew that. In truth, it would take nearly half a century before the people would force the state to start delivering on the promises of that day. The traditional take on Irish history is that no serious challenge to power emerged until the 1960s. In fact, challenges to power emerged much earlier than is assumed. The overriding issue was always power, who held it and how it was exercised. Sinn Féin was determined that it was entitled on both counts. To this end, Thomas Johnson and his party were told Labour must wait. The Labour Party did both a strong thing nationally and they did a prudent thing from the party point of view in abstaining from going into the election. Well, I, I doubt if it made much difference. I don't think they would have done very well. They, but the country wasn't ready for parliamentary Labour. It was the national issue was the main thing at the time. At the same time, men who were very closely attached to Labour were also closely attached to the national movement. In other words, again, there was this mixture of, of overlapping of loyalties, if you like, people who were, who were, who were all for Labour but saw in the movement something that they had to support and uh, didn't feel that it was, uh, that it was uh, against their principles to do so. On the same day as that first Doyle met, the first shots were fired in the War of Independence. Labour were told that it was in the national interest to hold back on social issues. The War of Independence and the subsequent Anglo-Irish Treaty were the priorities. Sinn Féin's preoccupation was with controlling people, 
in particular with pressurising Johnson's party into not running any Labour candidates in the 1918 and 1922 general elections. The Labour Party resisted the pressure in 1922 and fielded 18 candidates. 17 of them were elected. In fact, during that election, more votes were cast for non-Sinn Féin candidates. Ordinary people wanted politicians who would represent them on the bread and butter issues. There were 80,000 slum dwellers in Dublin alone. They'd had enough debate over constitutional matters and oaths of allegiance. Not that it really mattered in the end. The election was barely over before civil war intervened. In April 1922, the anti-treaty IRA took possession of the Four Courts building, which included the public record office. Two months later, the army of the pro-treaty government began a military bombardment of the Four Courts in order to force the Republicans out. This marked the opening phase of the Irish Civil War. Two days after that bombardment began, a huge explosion ripped through the public record office, destroying most of the contents. Some of the charred fragments of the documents were blown as far as the Bailey Lighthouse, over nine miles away. At the time of the IRA's occupation of the Four Courts, its commander, Rory O'Connor, was interviewed by the Irish Independent. Every care will be taken to preserve all documents, he said. But the IRA had packed the public record office with gelignite and munitions in the midst of a priceless repository of Irish history. Some 700 years of documents went up in smoke, including census returns, land registry deeds, baptismal certs, marriage certs. During the occupation, they barricaded the windows with the 1821 County Antrim census returns. The cultural vandalism involved in their destruction was not deemed significant by those inside. They were consumed with the internal power struggle of the Irish Republican movement. Rory O'Connor was visited by two scholars and Republicans, Owen McNeill and Seamus O'Kealig. They implored him to keep the records safe. But their pleas fell on deaf ears. In the midst of the Republican power struggle, history would be destroyed. My grandfather was Seamus O'Kealig, who was a doctor who practiced in Dublin for his entire life. But the family was actually from South Derry. His father had great ambitions for him, so he sent him off to be educated by the Jesuits in Clongos in County Kildare. And from there he went on to UCD. First of all, he trained as an early Irish historian, but he decided he couldn't make much of a living that way. And he then qualified as a doctor. He was away for a while studying gynaecology and obstetrics in Vienna, because that's where it was all happening in that field at the time. So he came back after that, uh, but in time for the Civil War. Uh, naturally, he was on the side of the irregulars because he was, an, he was a northerner, he was a Catholic, he was a, he was a passionate Irish speaker, so of course he didn't approve of dividing Ireland in two, and particularly leaving his 